today is day four uh, for the CrossCut saw class. And today we're going to cover the introduction to CrossCut saw filing. Uh, this is very condensed, uh, just to let everybody know. And I highly, highly, highly recommend that you go and work with a filer uh, before trying your first saw. Unless you get a, a saw that you absolutely don't care about, uh, that's, that's the best place to start. But, uh, there's a lot of equipment you'll see that's that's very necessary uh, for doing this well, and, and a lot of practice that goes into it. I still consider myself uh, fairly new to filing. I've I've successfully sharpened about seven saws, so uh, yeah. So here we go. Well, once again, I want to thank the Arthur Carhart uh, Wilderness Training Institute for allowing me to utilize much of their training documentation and photos for this training. And I also want to recognize the uh, Crosscut Saw Manual. Uh, this is a major source of uh, very neatly organized information for Crosscut filers. It was written by Warren Miller. And, uh, and many of the photos that you see in here today either come from here or from the, the Crosscut Sawyer, the Crosscut filer video was put out by the uh, Missoula Technology and Development Center. Here is that class. Uh, it's a, it's a self-guided tour that's available on YouTube. And the total running time is about 130 minutes. And I just wanted to make that available for folks. Uh, so once you see this first bit of information from this class, uh, if you're interested in it, go and check out this particular session. that will help a lot. Okay, so today for the objectives, I want to briefly cover the uh, PPE that you'll need for filing. We'll learn a general sequence for filing a crosscut saw. Explore different files, gauges, and tools for each step. And describe how to use each tool for each step of this process. So the PPE you'll need, that's good to have a nice set of thick leather gloves when you're working with files. Both protect yourself from the files themselves and also from the teeth that you're working on. Uh, you also need rubber or nitrile gloves if you're going to use any kind of solvent. But you don't want that to soak into your gloves and then also soak into your skin. So and, uh, safety glasses, this is really important whenever you're either working with a uh, any of the chemicals, or whenever you're pounding on saw teeth, uh, these saws are old, so it's, it's very likely that a, a tooth can break while you're working on it. And then hearing protection. Uh, a, lot of the, a lot of the hammering is pretty loud, so it's, it's a good idea to carry, carry some extra hearing protection with you. Here's the general sequence that we're gonna go through today. Uh, first step is to make sure you've got a good clean blade. Uh, next step, you wanna make sure that, that blade is nice and straight. And so we'll spend a fair bit of time talking about how to do that and, uh, and the tools that you'll need for, for that process. Uh, next comes the jointing phase where you make all of the teeth follow the arc of the saw. And there's a couple different tools you can use for that process. And then we'll jump into raker fitting. And that goes into how you actually develop a nice sharp cutting edge on each raker at the appropriate height between your cutters. After that, we'll talk about pointing cutters, uh, which involves changing the, the shape of the cutter to a nice almond edge that's right at the arc of the saw. And then we're gonna set our cutters Make sure that there's a little bit of an outward angle away from the blade of the saw so that it can open up a kerf. And then finally, we'll test the saw and I'll show you what that looks like. Okay. So, yeah, the first step is to clean the blade. Uh, when you're doing this in a workshop, you want good airflow, especially if you're using any kind of uh, solvent like a, uh, like a kerosene or an alcohol. Uh, good airflow promotes uh, really healthy work environment. So make sure you've got that. Uh, for this particular part of the process, if you're working in a, in a, in a workshop, you can use water. Uh, 
water does a does a pretty good job as long as you don't have pitch on this on the saw that you need to remove. Uh, if there's any kind of pitch on the saw, you definitely need to use some sort of cleaning solvent first. Uh, citrus based also works for this. Just make sure you clean it off before you start working through there, the rest of the process. So the tools that you want, and make sure you've got a, a healthy supply of rags, solvent, the pumice stone, which is good. We talked about a little bit yesterday. That removes a lot of the, uh, the fine rust that can start to accumulate just from regular wear and tear if it's not been uh, transported uh, well, or if you've happened to forget to oil the blade at one point. Uh, if you need a little bit more rust removal, uh, the axe stone or some steel wool is a couple of good items you can use for that part. You want to start slow though, especially with the axe stone. It will remove um, a lot of metal in a, in a hurry. So uh, you want to start with gentle uh, circular motion. Start at one end of the saw and work to the other. And then while you're doing that, you can see how much of a difference you're making. And then start really working that hack stone into the, uh, into the rust if you need to. And once again, making sure that you're using a lot of solvent to clear the rust out of the stone uh, so that you can, you can keep using the stone effectively. Well, the next step in the process is to stay, straighten the blade. Uh, the tools that you're going to use for this are you want two pairs of straight edges. You'll want one short and one long. Uh, the short ones are going to be about six inches in length. Uh, the longer ones, you know, 12 to 14 inches or so are, are really good. Uh, next, what's also helpful is a felt tip marker or a little grease pencil. You want a cross peen hammer, which you can see there in the bottom picture. And that allows you to quickly uh, adjust for any kind of um, odd position in, the, uh, in a kink or in a, uh, in, a, in a bend in the saw. That's a very, very useful tool. We'll talk about how to use that here in just a second. And then a flat soft steel anvil. And this, the softer steel is, is helpful because that allows the hammer to, to more effectively uh, move the, the metal in the blade. Um, if you had a really hard anvil there, you're not going to do a, a lot of movement without really hitting the blade hard, which causes other problems. So you want a, a, a softer steel for that particular anvil. So first you want to hang the saw vertically, and then you want to use those, the long pair of opposing straight edges and, and flex those uh, clockwise and counterclockwise on both sides of the saw at the same time. And what you're doing is you're seeing how smooth or how hard it is to twist those while they're in contact with the saw. And you're gonna move this up and down the length of the saw. And you're looking for gaps. Uh, you're, and you're, more, you're more feeling while you're doing this. You're, you're feeling those straight edges. If they, if they rotate quickly uh, and easily, that's, that's the spot to pay attention to because that means you've got a a little portion of the blade that's been pushed out away from the rest of the saw. And then with your felt tip marker, you can identify that spot. And as you rock those straight edges back and forth, once again rotating, you can identify where that kink or that bend actually travels within the blade of the saw. And you want to mark the high point of that spot as you travel down the saw. Uh, the, first, the first time you do this, you want to make sure that you are uh, capturing every major um, bend in the saw or kink to start off with, identify those, and then take it over to the, hand, the, uh, the anvil. And you're doing that just because you want to minimize the number of trips back and forth between your, your hanging station here and then your, your anvil. Uh, there will be quite a few usually, especially if it's an older saw that hasn't seen uh, much attention. So here's the, the cross beam hammer part. So the cross beam has one end of the hammer that's oriented with the handle, and then the other is oriented 90 degrees to the handle. And what that allows you to do is quickly change from one side of the hammer to the other if you've got a, a you know a, a fold or a kink that travels either 
across the, the, the body of the saw, across the blade of the saw, or along the length of the saw. Uh, and you'll see both types whenever you're, whenever you're first working with this. And then whenever you're hammering with, the, uh, with this cross bean hammer, you want to make sure that you hold the hammer so that as you strike the blade, the hammer hits flat. Uh, if you're if you're going to hit with the top or the bottom of the the, the face of the hammer, you're not going to be nearly as effective, uh, and you may have to do some more dents. So uh, this is a it's a challenging thing to learn, uh, and you don't want to swing the hammer very hard. You want to do most of the work just by using gravity. Lift up the hammer, and then let the hammer fall on its own. Especially when you're starting out, and you, when you're trying to learn to get a feel for how the swing happens. So once again, there's that position that you want to finish your swing. You want to make sure that, that the face of that hammer is absolutely hitting flat. And if, and if you're not, you need to adjust that. So once you've made your dozen or two dozen trips between your hanging station and your anvil, uh, the next part is to joint the saw. And so this is going to even all of the teeth into the arc of the saw. Um, this is very important so that whenever you're finished filing, all of your teeth uh, match up along that curve. If they don't match up along that curve, what happens is you'll get a flat spot and your saw becomes very hard to pull through that portion of the saw. And the longer the saw, the more critical jointing becomes. Uh, right here. The tools you need for jointing, there's uh, two different versions of jointers. Uh, there's long ones and short ones. And they hold a special seven or eight inch crosscut file. It's a blunted mill bastard file. And usually with a, a fine, uh, fine uh, cuts, finely milled. You want, you want to make sure that it's firmly affixed in your jointer. And then you also want to use a saw vise and the saw vise needs to hold the saw effectively in a vertical orient orientation for this portion. Now there's a whole bunch of different ways to make saw vices. Uh, the best ones are those that can rotate from a vertical orientation to about a 45 degree angle with the teeth of the saw then pointing out away from you. Uh, for this part, you want it vertical. And then, uh, so if you're gonna join a longer saw, you want to make sure that you're using a long jointer and a long jointer has uh, special hardened steel feet at either end and it takes a lot of practice to make sure that you you set those feet uh, in the right orientation with each other in the file uh, so that you effectively create the curve that you need for that saw uh, you could almost teach an entire class on how to do that i think uh, from my experience now, the shorter jointer, once again, is better for the shorter saws and especially those with small spaces between the teeth. You know, for these, think of your one man bucking saw, that type of thing. But that, once again, practice and hands on instruction is extremely important. Okay, so once you've got all of your, your teeth jointed, the next step is to fit your acres. Uh, so there's two two stages to this, or really three. You want to file the rakers, uh, and you want to file the gullets, and then you also want to swedge the rakers. Uh, then there's the various tools you're going to need for this process. You want a seven or eight inch slim paper file, uh, and that one's going to have the teeth um, remaining entire on the sharp edges. You want a, a small feeler gauge, a raker gauge, a six inch slim taper file with safe corners. So you've got a little bit smaller slim taper file, but on that particular one, you've actually ground off all of the edges along the corners of that file. Then the six inch mill bastard file. And uh, once again, your saw vise. And then for the swedging stage, you want a, an eight to 16 ounce tinners riveting hammer. And basically it's 
it's a very streamlined hammer that has a very small face on either end of it. And you need that small face to direct uh, your hammer blow into the uh, each individual tooth without impacting an adjacent tooth. And that, that's why that, that small face is important. So again, the feeler gauge and then a pin gauge. So let's see some of this stuff. So for the raker fitting portion, once you've got your jointing complete, you need to cut the raker gullet down to create an effective angle on the each, each side of the raker. So the deeper you go, the, the, the more narrow that angle becomes. And as far as the, the actual depth is concerned, you really don't have any set depth you need to go down to. All you need to do is create that angle up at the top of the tooth. So that's your stopping point. And it's best if, as you see the files being held there, you don't want to come straight across the, the tooth. You want to come slightly up because it saves your ears and it's also much easier for the file to remove metal from that portion of the tooth. Uh, the other thing you want to do for switch preparation is clean out the, the sides of, of, the, of the entire raker tooth all the way down to the deep gullet uh, and expose the parent material there. So the, the, the shiny steel there. Uh, if you're saw seen a lot of time uh, without being addressed, uh, you'll notice that there's just some minor rust that starts to form there. And that rust needs to re be removed. Otherwise, the, the tooth is brittle. So whenever you try to swedge it later, uh, you stand a, more of a chance of breaking the raker tooth. So once you've got that cleaned out, this is the, uh, the swedging uh, hammer stroke kind of freeze framed it there in, in time for you to see exactly where that hammer is striking on the tooth. Uh, your first tooth on the saw, you'll hammer just a little ways and then you'll, you'll set that depth uh, for about nine thousandths of an inch. And you can do that with a feeler gauge and a hard piece of steel. So there's the image there on the, on the top. The lay that, that flat and straight edge of steel uh, between the two adjacent teeth on either side of the raker, and you'll swedge that first raker tooth down until you get about, uh, for most saws, about nine thousandths of an inch. Uh, your final filed surface on that tooth will be about twelve thousandths of an inch, but you're going to stop shy of that because you've got an additional process with the raker gauge itself to remove the top of that that surface of the tooth, um, you'll make, you want to make sure that you stop shy of the full depth. And then for the rest of the teeth, you're going to use a pin gauge. So once you get the first tooth set and you set your pin gauge for your nine thousandths of an inch, then you can go through the rest of your, your raker teeth and swedge them over so that the, uh, the pin gauge just barely touches the top of each tooth. Uh, it takes practice to set that pin correctly and to make sure that it doesn't slip on you and something that you really want to uh, keep track of as you're moving along the, the saw. And for consistency's sake, you always want to do uh, one set of rakers. So each, each raker tooth has two little cutting surfaces at the top, one going each direction. You want to focus on all the left-hand rakers first or all the right-hand rakers first, depending on your... Uh, your comfort level. And then you want to flip the saw around and then do the same thing uh, coming back the other way so that you've touched all of the, the rakers and switched them over with consistent ergonomics. That's why you're doing that. Uh, next, you want to dress each raker. And this is where you use the. Hey, Dave. Yep, go ahead. Yeah, hop, hop, in, hop in here real quick. Um, Absolutely. Just, just so everybody's clear, clear in, an, in a normal in-person saw certification course, in other words, getting certified to use the saw, um, we would just barely be touching on sharpening, mostly so people understand how critical it is that you take care of the saw in the field uh, because of how detailed the process is to get them back in working shape. So 
I've just had a couple of questions, you know, for if you're going to show up at your field certification, whatever, you don't have to have all these tools. Um, um, but this is great information for you to know. It really helps refine how this all works for you. Um, but don't worry about all the individual tools unless you're ready to, to step up to be in a filer. Um, and uh, that's generally a three to five day course. Just thought I'd share that with everybody because of a couple of questions, Dave. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Bill. Yeah, it is a very involved process. I, I think it is important, though, to, to relay this information to, to every cross cut player, though, uh, just so you know what's involved with it. And it gives you that much more of a, a sense of uh, why you need to make sure that you take care of these things in the field. Yeah, so the next part, you're going to take that, that very small, slim taper file where the corners have been removed and just very gently uh, file off the underside of the raker tip. And so you're removing the burr that tends to form while you're swedging. And you wanna make sure that it's, it's a smooth surface then uh, from, from front to back uh, across the face of that tube. And then finally, so once you've got all of the burrs addressed and, the, and all of the raker teeth are addressed, then you can get into the, the final edging sequence. So for this, you're gonna set your raker gauge at three thousandths of an inch uh, to get back down to, to 12 thousandths of an inch, which is your final, uh, your final setting. And you wanna make sure that you file uh, just the very edge of that tooth. And if you've got a raker gauge that has a slope to it, uh, you're finished at this point. But if you don't have a slope, if that raker gauge has a, a flat uh, 90 degree edge to it, which some do, or a filing plate to it, then you need to uh, dress the, the top of the raker tooth here and file in a little bit of a clearance angle uh, so that the, the very point of the raker tooth can cut effectively. Once you're done with the rakers, then you can move on to the cutters. So here's a jointed cutter uh, before you start the pointing process. And for this, you'll need a special crosscut file if you want the, the small mill bastard blunt file for lens tooth saws, or a 68 inch Great American file uh, for the champion tooth saws, and then your saw vise. You want to rotate the saw vise so that the teeth are pointing away at a 35 to 45 degree angle in vertical. You want to file from the base of the, the cutter up towards the, the tip. And then you want to make an almond edge. So you want to make a slight curve to that edge as you work up towards the tip of the tooth. You want to keep the point centered as you remove the material. And you want to file until the jointing mark, the very, very, very top of the tooth is just barely been filed away. And at that point, you'll stop. Here you can see that. So tooth on the left has been jointed, not filed down. And the tooth on the right has been where the, the pointing is complete. Now you can still see that there's some remaining filing burrs on that edge of the tooth. And to, to fix those, you'll wrap the file around the back side of the tooth for the final couple strokes. And that, that cleans those burrs off. Very, very gentle. The next step is to set the cutters. Uh, for this stage, you want a hand, a handheld anvil, an assortment of spiders, and then a setting hammer. Uh, a setting hammer that I've displayed down there is the, uh, the number four Atkins. Um, it's just like the swedging hammer. You get a very small face uh, with, with a decent amount of heft in the, in the hammer. And so the process for this, you want to hold the hand anvil on the back side of the lance, uh, just right up at the tip of the, almost at the tip of the tooth. And then you're going to strike the, the face of the tooth, uh, the part, the, the surface where the files has uh, cut the clean edge um, into the hand anvil. And you wanna go slowly 
And as you go through this process, you take the, the spider to check and make sure that your set is consistent from tooth to tooth. And then typically with most saws, you're gonna look for a, a set of about 12 thousandths of an inch. And you'll need to set your, your spider uh, before you get into this, this process. And that's, that's something that uh, you'd have to do in person. And the final step here, you wanna test your saw. And then this is where you find out how, how good of a job you've done. You wanna check the, the filing for smooth operation along the whole length of the saw. Make sure that there's nowhere that the saw is sticking in your cut. You want to make sure that you watch the wood shavings and you want long noodles, uh, just intermittent small whiskers uh, that form along the edges of those noodles. And then if, you, if you're forming large, large frequent whiskers and short chips, uh, that means that your rakers are probably too tall. And then if you don't have any whiskers whatsoever, that means your rakers are probably filed just a little bit too short. So here's what really good chips look like. You can see that they're, it's throwing a, a lot of nice long chips. Uh, a few smaller ones thrown in the mix. And then along the edges, you can see here, you want just a very, very, very small amount of whisker uh, that shows up along the edge of the, the cut noodle. And uh, if your noodles look like that, then you've got a you've done a really good job with your, with your saw. Okay, so we're getting into the summary now. Uh, so the sequence for filing a crosscut saw is important. If each step prepares for the next in the process. Uh, we've explored different files, gauges, and tools for each step. We introduced how to use various tools for each step. And please, by all means, uh, if you're interested in doing more filing, uh, make sure you attend an in-person training. Uh, unless you've got a saw, once again, that you're, you're more than happy to try and file on your own. Uh, that's all I've got for the, uh, the filing portion here. Um, here's a, the old filing shop. I think this was taken up in Washington. And you can see uh, just how good the lighting is in this particular area and, uh, and the, the access these guys have to their, their saw. Uh, I think it's kind of fun to note that the, the filers were typically the, the highest paid personnel in logging camps. Uh, if those, those saws weren't cutting well, then uh, of course the company wasn't going to make money. So. Yeah, with that, we can take questions. Dave, Dave, there's a question. Um, how frequently should a saw be sharpened? Yeah, that's a real good question. So, uh, Crosscut saws don't need real frequent sharpening if you're taking care of them. Uh, you know, if, you, if you're using a saw a lot, you know, daily or several times a week, uh, you can anticipate going, you know, a, a month or two uh, for, you know, average trail work uh, without any need to sharpen a saw at all. Um, and a lot of the times with, inter with intermittent use, you know, you can probably go a year or two. Uh, so, yeah, it shouldn't be a very frequent process. And then uh, we got another question from Garrett. Uh, where can we find information about in-person training for sharpening? Yeah, so there are there are some filers uh, around the country that do host trainings. Uh, we can send you guys some links uh, to some of those folks. I, I know up here in the Northeast, we've got uh, an individual by the name of Larry Walter, uh, and he does offer trainings uh, <coughs> on an as-needed basis. Uh, so if you get in contact with him, he can uh, he can he can set up a training. Um, I know uh, Dolly Chapman has also taught filing courses 
uh, for a long, long time. And uh, that's who Larry actually went to initially. So, uh, but yeah, there's, there's not a whole lot of folks out there that are really teaching this process anymore. So I highly encourage anybody that's interested uh, to, to get involved and to go and, and see these folks and, and start that process. Uh, we're gonna need a lot more people in the future to uh, step up and do this for us, so. Um, there's some other questions. Uh, who makes the best files for sharpening? <laughs> uh, the file that's the right type for the job you need is the best one you can get your hands on. <laughs> they, uh, oftentimes, the, uh, there's, there's not many makers anymore that, that make truly good quality files. And, and the, a lot of the ones that you buy these days are, are, are made in subpar conditions. Um, if you can get the, the great American uh, files, you're doing well. Uh, Nicholson also makes pretty good files, although some of the ones we've used from them in the past uh, have mixed um, mixed results. But one of those two companies usually usually does a pretty good job. And there's another question: Where can I buy the tools to sharpen? So uh, sharpening tools are hard to come by. The best place to find them is uh, garage sales, honestly, and old barns. Yeah, if you can <laughs> take a take a road tour and and visit uh, those those areas, estate sales especially. Uh, that's that's where you're really going to get deals on these parts and and, uh, and those tools. Uh, otherwise, your best bet is online with eBay or some other website like that. And you're going to pay through the nose to get to get those tools um, if you do it that way. But yeah, keeping your eyes peeled, happenstance, and uh, and a fair bit of luck. <laughs> and then, if you guys are interested to know what tools are out there, uh, you can find the old manuals from like Simon's or. Um, Piston uh, in, in those companies and, and those manuals are, are online and you can see the, the different options that are available. And then, uh, and then I would look online too for, um, for current filer information. A lot of filers do have preferences over uh, the tools that they find to be the most useful. And uh, I, would, I would definitely take their, their words of advice um, pretty seriously when it comes to choosing good quality tools. Uh, I do believe there's some other folks out now that are making their own filing tools because some of these tools are so hard to come by. And uh, but I, I don't have any good contact information at the moment. But I can look around and definitely, if, if folks are interested, we can we can try and get you in touch with some people to do that. Can you explain how a circular relates to the saw and how this applies to sawing motion again. Yeah, so the circle, the arc of the saw, yes. Yeah, so the, the arc of the saw, what that does is it allows you to focus the weight of that saw on just a specific um, length of tooth or so many teeth in the crosscut saw to effectively drive those teeth into the curve. Uh, so if, if you had just a, a flat saw, without that arc in there, all of the teeth, uh, once you start to, to bury the saw in the cut, are, are trying to, uh, to cut at the same time. And then you would have to vary that, vary your saw by, by rocking it back and forth, uh, which isn't nearly as effective as having a, an arc already cut in the saw that allows you to, to focus on just a few teeth at a time and make sure that they're cutting effectively as you move that saw back and forth. And from Rachel, she says, uh, when I send my saws off, the filers like it if I take the time to clean up the saw with the pumice first. And that um, 
allows them to concentrate on sharpening the saw rather than cleaning it and reduces the cost. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, if you can, if you can make the filer's life easier, it, they will be very happy with you. Uh, so yeah, reduces, reduces cost and it also makes your, uh, your future uh, filing needs that much easier to obtain. So, very good point. There's a question. Uh, what is the the demand for saw filers? It's a, as far as I know, it's it's steady. Uh, there, there's there's a constant need, and I, I think for the filers that are good, uh, they're in high demand. Uh, so, yeah, if somebody's out there that's interested in this sort of thing, I, it's a it's a good thing to get into. And uh, yeah, if you can uh, practice this technique, you know, gain a, a fair amount of experience before you start opening up to uh, the business side of it, uh, you can do pretty well, I think. And this is probably more of a question for Bill, but do you know if Dan DeWicki is still filing for saws? Hey, I'm here. Um, Dan, is, is filing for anybody. Well, I don't, the answer is I don't know. Um, Dan did move from Virginia to Michigan. Uh, I know he's still involved in this world quite a bit. I'm assuming he's still filing, um, but um, how much he's taking in other people's saws, I don't know, but he generally has a whole bunch of them. So uh, it's something I can look into. And somebody else asked, uh, answered that, and they said, "Yeah, Dan did three saws, three saws for saws this year." There's the answer. <clears throat> yeah, there we go. There's also, um, if you're in the southeast, Jim Holland sharpen saws. Um, you know, there's a, there's. There's a lot of sort of people just that have the skill that are around the country, maybe not at the level of Dolly where she takes, you know, people ship her saws from all over the world to sharpen them. But there's a lot of different people. Ken Jones is somebody that I know sharpen saws in Tennessee there. So um, there's, there's a need for more because every time uh, that saws would offer a saw course with Dolly Chapman, a saw filing course, uh, we would have more people apply to be in the course than there were spots. Um, now, some of that's just some guys that like to tinker around, guys and girls that like to tinker around to do saws, but most of those people are sharpening saws for other people or want to sharpen saws for their organization, that sort of thing. Any other questions we need to answer? I'm gonna keep going, Dave. Passed by through there. There was a, says, when do I need to debark the log before I start cutting? Yeah, before I start sawing. Um, yeah, so for that particular question, you know, once you complete your OLEC process, and you identify that very specific location where you're going to put in your cut and what type of cut you're going to do, uh, that's whenever you can go ahead and debark that, that area. Um, there's another question about what's the cost range to sharpen saws? I don't know about the range. Uh, I know what, what we've paid in the past, but yeah, I think most folks uh, work by foot. Yeah, I, I, for some reason, $8 a foot seems to stick in my head, but that's probably old. Yeah, I think more of the recent stuff I've seen was 12 or more. 
Um, there's another question, are there people who can repair broken teeth? Yeah, they're out there. I think, uh, Bill, you mentioned that there were, there, there was at least one one person you knew that could do that. We maybe need to clarify about cutting into the bind versus um, cutting into the tension. Um, and I, I guess I'll try to make a run and answer that question a little bit. I think maybe a slide or something I said or one of us said gave the impression that you don't want to cut into the tension. And of course, actually from a ease of work perspective, you do want to cut into the tension and generally you will cut it, be cutting into the tension. You just don't want to be cutting into the tension in a way in which you're the potential release point um, when, that, when that finally gives way. Um, and I also had mentioned about cutting that I, I like to when they're particularly when they're severe tension that I first like to cut into, which also generally means there are corresponding severe uh, compression. I like to cut into the compression side as far as I can. And, and the example I gave specifically was related to trying to keep uh, a buck from barber tearing. Uh, in, this, in this case, where there's severe compression on the bottom, uh, um, high tension on the top. Um, but of course, in, in general, cutting into the tension is going to have the material working with your saw. Um, but you can always cut into the compression too, particularly as we give the example of if you cut into the compression to the point that you can get wedges in before you potentially get your saw pinched. So I don't know if I answered your question from earlier. I think it was Paul that asked that question earlier. But I probably just made that clear as mud. But there are going to be scenarios where you're cutting into the compression, scenarios where you're cutting into the tension. But what you don't want to be is if it's side bind, if it's side uh, tension, you don't want to be on the side of the tension um, it, at all, but certainly not when you're getting close to the finishing cuts um, on that buck. So. Will there ever be a new generation of high quality steel saws built? I think Pete, I think you answered that on one of your, one of our days here. Yeah, so there's a gentleman, uh, um, he's actually a volunteer on the Mount Hood National Forest and, and works with Pacific Crest Trail Association, um, David Rowe, and he has been uh, working for about the last eight years um, to um, uh, design and manufacture a, a modern crosscut um, saw. Um, and he's continuing to work on that. He's trying to get the metallurgy right and then trying to find a manufacturer um, that can, it can build those saws. So um, that's about all I have on that. That's, that's the only person that I know of that's working on a modern uh, crosscut saw. Yes, and so related question, Steve asked the question, it says, um, that we've referenced the modern saws not having the quality, is it worth waiting for a, basically a, a vintage saw to show up versus uh, using one of the new ones? I mean, if it's the only thing you have, it's the only thing you have. Um, my experience with Curtis saws is uh, they don't hold an edge um, at all for very long. Uh, they are not, um, if you remember Pete's instruction the other day, they're not uh, taper grind. They're not crescent ground. So they're just one thickness all the way through. So they're quick to bind. They are very, very heavy. So they're also not fun to carry. Um, uh, but if it's the only thing you have and you've got a buck that's bigger than a katana can handle, um, yeah, you're certainly going to have to use that. But I would, you generally can find saws on eBay or, um, um, Peter, Dave, do you know if Axel is still selling saws out of Tacoma? Um, that used to be a fairly um, consistent place you could go. Uh, literally, the website is the Axel. Um, and he's always sort of got saws coming in, saws going out. Um, and again, eBay, um, I think there's one particular eBay seller named Am I Crazy to Sell? 
the number two uh, where I have bought some saws before. And then always checking your local antique shops. And if the teeth are all there, if you can see enough of it to make sure that it's not pitted, you can, I mean, we're not down to zero on traditional, you know, vintage saws that are out there, but, um, but they're certainly going to be the better option than trying to lug a Curtis saw into the woods, in my opinion. Yeah. Oh, Steve's posted in the chat, uh, work with a small trail club in the southeast with mixed hardwood pine forests. If you could buy just one good vintage two-person saw, what kind of tooth pattern and saw would it be? Yeah, good question. Um, my experience, the tooth pattern that you'd, you'd be interested in is uh, either a probably a perforated lance or a great American, especially if you're going to be cutting uh, a, a lot of hardwood material. Uh, the other one that, that stands out in my mind is a, is a really good saw that you could use as a, uh, a champion grind. Yeah, having having worked with, having pulled a saw a lot in the in the southeast, we we really leaned on perforated lance tooth um, or just lance tooth saws uh, with great success. And then the question is, how much of a set do you want in the teeth? I think we generally went with twelve thousandths of an inch set. Um, uh, and it would work in hardwoods and softwoods. Mm -hmm. And with some of the with some of the grinds out there, you know, the, the precision grinds or the, the those those saws where the uh, the back of the saw has been ground away quite a bit, and the teeth are consistently the uh, same thickness at the, the the front of the saw. Uh, some of those saws you can get away with a little bit less set uh, because that. That saw naturally tapers away from the teeth, and uh, that makes them that much easier to uh, to run. So, so Grady asked a question about the Crosscut Saw Company in Seneca, New York. Um, I don't think they're making their own saws. I think they're just selling used saws. I think they make some of the reproduction handles and related equipment. Um, but correct me if I'm wrong. If anybody out there knows if I'm wrong about their. Um, I'm pretty sure the Crosscut Saw Company, like the Axe Hall, is selling uh, um, vintage saws. Um, Peter Molly, to answer your question, why they're superior um, is the yeah, partially quality issue, the steel that they were made out of, the process in which they were made, in which uh, their crescent grounder, their taper ground with the back of the saw being thinner than the, the front of the blade and therefore they don't bind as fast. Um, but the quality of metal in the current, the only version of a current saw you can buy is pretty substandard and tends to lose its edge really fast. And if you are always having to resharpen a crosscut saw, you're just never going to be efficient. So they're just a they're better material. Uh, the process by which they understood um, how the saw functions is all I know to put it. Surely Curtis knows how they function, but um, I, I don't, as far as I know, Curtis, uh, Curtis doesn't make a taper, tapered saw. Um, so, yeah, Ben Flicker Forge, uh, I think it was the one of the companies I was thinking about that does the, the, yeah, good, good thing, Com comment in the question and answer box. Actually, it was. Flicker Forge, I was trying to think of the other company besides the Crosscut Saw Company that makes the uh, hardware for the handles. Um, and they are really great. Uh, the quality is very good on those. Other questions? Dave, repeat things you'd like to go back over. You want to just let people put their hands up and ask questions. Um, yeah, that's that's fine. If people have questions, um, they can either uh, raise their hand or they can put it in the chat. We can answer them. I'll uh, look for you all to raise your hands if anybody. Okay. Yeah, I see another one there from Peter M. It says, uh, would it be practical or cost effective to make vintage saws today, if that makes sense? Yeah, I think uh, Pete talked to that just a little bit ago, but uh, yeah, go ahead, Peter. Yeah, go ahead, Peter. 
Um, I, I just to, to clarify my question. Um, is is there any practical reason that prevents people from making crosscut saws today that are as high quality as the old ones? That's what I was. That's what I meant by saying making vintage saws oh. today. I, I think maybe they don't think there's a big enough market. Probably. Okay. How many how many wilderness nerds are there? We have to calculate how many of us are doing this work. I, I'm guessing it's just a supply and demand issue, what it would take to set up tooling maybe. But I'm excited to hear Pete said that there is somebody looking at, you know, doing the metallurgy and, and uh, maybe putting it together. But I'm guessing it's a, it's a supply and demand question and just not enough demand. Okay. All right. Thanks for that. Appreciate it. Yep. Thanks for clarifying that. And Steve, Steve C says, not a question, but you guys have planted the seed to go on to class C and also learn filing. Thank you all. Hey, yeah, awesome. Glad to hear that. That's something else we need more of is more instructors. Um, Pete, can you talk about what the new policy, um, how you go about, I know like SAWS went through the process of becoming a um, provider, um, what that looks like for organizations. Um, to become a provider, not just the step for the individual to become a C Sawyer, but for an organization to become a providing a provider of SAW certification. Yeah, we're we're actually um, going to streamline that whole process. Um, and uh, so, if a cooperator group like SAWS um, uh, wants to be able to put on training and and evaluations. Um, basically, if, if they have somebody within their organization that is at the C level or have at the C evaluator level, um, then then they can they can um, train and evaluate um, um, anybody, and that um, that training that that certification is good on any national forest system lands. So we're and we're actually working um, with all different cooperator groups <clears throat> and partner groups to to build capacity within them uh, so that they are able to um, put on these trainings. Um, the um, unfortunately within the Forest Service, most of our our trainers and evaluators um, are also within the ranks of the firefighting force. And um, with the longer fire seasons, um, the, they're, they're just not available um, to put on the trainings when, when it's mostly needed. So we're, we're working on different, different ways to, to build that capacity. Yeah. Gordon asked, will there be salt sharpening classes this year at Nine Mile? I don't know. Um, could try to find out for you, Gordon, and get that answered. Uh, it seems like those. Um, um, yeah, Pete, if you if you want to give your answer, but Gordon, I'll try to look into that um, maybe while Pete's talking and see if they're still going to offer a, a saw sharpening class at Nine Mile this year. And, I have uh, not heard that they are. And, okay, and they normally do a training at, at Powell Ranger District um, in Idaho, and I've not heard that's going to happen yet either. So, Pete, uh, do you want to bring up you want to bring up? Hey, this is Pete Irvin. Um, can y'all hear me? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Hey, excellent stuff. Amazing to have traditional skills taught in a virtual environment. And I hear from a bunch of folks that there's a lot of value. So thank y'all. Uh, I said in the chat, I could take a stab at addressing the question that was in the chat about trying to procure vintage saws uh through official forest service channels and it's obviously tough number one is, and it's sort of two-pronged number one is you got to convince your procurement person that they have the authority to do that and the first several i worked with said but you can buy them new in the forestry suppliers catalog from an outfit called curtis 
but you got to get a sympathetic procurement official. Uh, you can get that person by using the MTDC study on vintage versus uh, brand new saws and hell take them out in the woods with you. And number two is you got to find a source that's willing to accept government procurement methods, which by and large nowadays means a credit card. Um, you know, the Forest Service doesn't do personal checks anymore. The Forest Service, we're real, well, I say we, I'm retired. Forest Service as an agency is pretty good at making things tough sometimes. And in procurement, they excel at doing that. But two prongs, one is finding the sympathetic person that has purchasing authority, uh, whether that's a purchase card or something else. And then number two is finding a source that'll take the types of payment that the Forest Service can offer. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Pete. I've certainly been in a, several tool caches where the procurement officer clearly had authorized them to buy Curtis saws, and I never saw those saws ever leave the tool cache. So, um, <clears throat> so thanks for that um, pathway, Pete. Appreciate it. Um, uh, Dylan asks, are there good in-depth reference resources on these tools other than the Forest Service manuals? I have a stab at that answer. I think the four, I'll say, I think the Forest Service manuals are about the best you're going to find, probably. Um, could they probably be updated? Sure. Um, but I, I, I'm not sure what just a really thorough Google search might uncover, uh, what else might be out there on all the, whether it's the, uh, all the tools needed for sharpening or you know, that sort of thing. But uh, I think the manuals are pretty pretty close to what I've seen. CrosscutSawyer.com, Nick says. Thank you, Nick. There's another question from Steve. Um, he's asking, are you saying a fellow Class C Sawyer can evaluate me and certify me as a, as a C when I'm ready? Um, no, it would take a um, somebody who is a C Sawyer evaluator at that level, and it's going to take two people, two of those, um, to uh, allow you to move from a B to a C. One thing I would suggest is, in the meanwhile, finding ways to though refine your presentation chops. They might be able to let you teach in a class in which two C Sawyers are in the class, um, just so that you can start to get comfortable with teaching the material both in the classroom and in the field. Because um, I think a lot of people sort of go through the process and then they never teach until they're there to try to get certified as an instructor. And it really helps to have those opportunities to present in the classroom and in the field. Even if somebody else is going to step in and correct you if you're wrong or going to be the person who's actually doing the evaluation on the demonstration of the skills. So. Eli asked uh, about the learning curve for learning to sharpen saws. How long is that curve? What does that curve look like? Dave, you got any thoughts on that? Yeah, so. Uh, being somebody that took my first filing class only about three years ago, I can say that uh, it's it, it can be challenging and, and it varies by person. Um, but I would I would anticipate at least you know two or three saws to, to start to get good, and then um, and you're probably looking at investing at least a week in the class itself, and then probably a you know at least another good solid week or two on your own. Um, you know, once again, working through several saws uh, before you really start to get the hang of it. Thanks, Dave. John, ask any thoughts on regarding lanolin-based lubricants? I honestly haven't used them before. Uh, seems like it would be a, a good mix, but I, I really haven't used one, so I, I can't speak to it. 
Pete, you want to give us any final thoughts? Uh, boy, I just appreciate everybody um, participating and being willing to um, learn how to use a crosscut saw and um, being available to help um, maintain trails out there. It's, uh, it's an important work um, that, that helps everybody who visits National Forest and I appreciate everybody who's um, participated this week. Dave? Yeah, I'll just echo Pete's sentiments there. And, and uh, it's like to say thanks for everybody attending. Uh, yeah, you know, take this knowledge and run with it. You know, go go work with as many folks as you can and, uh, you know, and get as, get as much experience as you can possibly get. Uh, we're going to need everybody uh, to, to make sure that we've got good, good Sawyers out there in the field that are doing great work for us. And uh, yeah, couldn't couldn't be happier with the attendance. So, yeah, and I'll just add, I'm, I'm super uh, super excited that we've had Dave and Pete available to us um, to teach. That's one of the advantages of the virtual format is being able to get some of the best in the country available um, to be able to teach this. Actually, having Pete as you know the SAW program manager for the Forest Service is just fantastic. Um, I just would encourage you to get um, to get out in the field a little bit before um, before you go to your field certification, particularly with the axe, and maybe uh, run through a cord of firewood. I have found that um, one of the biggest things that holds folks back um, in the field training is uh, people having struggles with their axe skills, and you do have to demonstrate those axe skills for your certification with the saw. Um, and I think many of you that are on here know that axe skills are very much related to muscle memory. So as much time you can spend uh, swinging that axe is good. Obviously, splitting wood is different than opening a scarf, but um, it is um, always a good thing to do. So but I want to thank all of you all um, for being here this week. Uh, Chaco uh, or Steve, I think it was. Uh, we'll make sure that we know that you were here all four days. Um, um, and so. We'll, uh, in the next week or so, we'll be working to get these letters out to those of you who are here all week uh, so that you can present those uh, to get certified. Again, if you have a current certification that would have expired, I think um, Pete covered this earlier, that would have expired during the pandemic, uh, that certification is being extended until this fall. Uh, so you may not have as much of a rush to get recertified at this point if your certification was in good standing, basically at the beginning of the uh, pandemic, it, it's going to be extended until this fall um, and when we can maybe get back into another regular rhythm of having certification courses in the field. So uh, we really appreciate you all joining us for this week. Uh, it's been uh, it's been a great class, a great series of classes. Dave, Pete, Tisha, I want to thank you guys for the time that went into this, all of the meetings we had before, um, before the uh, before the actual Skills Institute. Sorry, no. Got five th things going on here, um, but thanks to you, to you three, um, and thanks to all the participants, and we'll look forward to seeing you guys uh, in the wilderness uh, with us all on your shoulder. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>